So what I want to talk about, of course, is, again, framing this in, in what we know about normal hematopoiesis. Um, of course, uh, for those of you who are perhaps new to this, uh, to this conference, um, you've heard some talk about stem cells. And I just want to first go over what we know about normal hematopoiesis. So HSC is the normal hematopoietic stem cell. We think we have about 10,000 of these in all of us. And these we had need to carry with us throughout our lives. And this is important because these cells have to have built into them mechanisms of survival. Um, and uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. But as you saw uh, in Suzanne's presentation, these cells give rise to what are called common myeloid progenitors and common lymphoid progenitors that subsequently give rise to the more mature cells. On the left, you're seeing the granulocytes, uh, the, the, the monocytes, uh, red blood cells, and then platelets, T cells, and B cells. And you see that these, uh, the, the lymphoid cells on the right come off of a common lymphocyte progenitor, whereas the, the myeloid cells come off of the common myeloid progenitor. So this is normal hematopoiesis. And we believe that uh, the BCR able mutation actually arises in the hematopoietic stem cell or in a very primitive cell. Uh, and then this actually preferentially drives the, um, the, the differentiation of uh, such affected cells towards the myeloid uh, lineage. This is why we consider CML, of course, to be a myeloproliferative neoplasm, um, where we have typically too many granulocytes uh, produced. Um, if there are uh, additional mutations, um, either at the, the so-called GMP uh, uh, level or further down in the lymphocyte uh, lineage. Um, this can lead, of course, to the, the, the genesis of uh, blast crisis. The fact that we can identify both myeloid and lymphoid blast phase disease um, suggests that um, BCR able does indeed occur in a very primitive uh, hematopoietic uh, cell, perhaps the hematopoietic stem cell. And the reason I bring this up is because efforts to target <clears throat> stem cells, it, it leads you to really question whether it's going to be possible with any sort of a, a pharmacologic treatment um, to target specifically uh, the viability of CML stem cells. There has to be something uniquely different about them that can be exploited, and I'll come back to that in the end. So this now is basically showing you the same thing, but I've, now you're seeing the, um, the myeloid cells on the right and uh, the, the, the lymphoid cells on the left. And on the left side, you see normal hematopoiesis. And on the right side, I've colored it red just to denote that this is where BCR able is uh, detectable. And again, you see the, the overproduction of um, granulocytes. And this is what it would look like in a newly diagnosed uh, patient. <clears throat> now, if a patient now, uh, now you see on the left, you see an untreated patient. If a patient starts TKI therapy, and has morphologic remission, meaning that their white blood cell count comes down to normal, but they don't have any cytogenetic uh, response, what you would see is more or less the picture on the right. So basically, BCR able is still present in all the cells, but the number of cells is normal. Uh, in contrast, in patients who have a complete cytogenetic response, as you've heard, we believe that although the majority of uh, the, the more mature cells do not have BCR able, not because they are, this is a little bit erroneous because this is implying that the, the, the red, the BCR able positive cells are giving rise to normal cells. That's not the case. It's there are normal cells that are, normal stem cells that are feeding into that. But we do have persistence of these, uh, of these uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells that have uh, BCR able. And this is what has been the subject of a lot of research in an effort to try to eradicate this population. Obviously, if we could eradicate that population, we could presumably affect a true uh, disease cure. So what do we mean by disease cure? Of course, um, um, cure in some ways is a rather simple word, but it's actually a rather complex concept. So um, cure can be defined as no evidence of disease by any uh, testing method, but as you heard from Dr. Salio, um, the limits of our ability to detect disease are, are, are always going to be limited. Um, we will never have the ability to look in every last cell for the presence of BCR able, at least not uh, in, an, in a living individual. Um, and so another definition of cure is, of course, the functional cure or the ability to stop treatment and never suffer disease recurrence. Um, and what does it mean to never suffer disease recurrence? Well, we have follow-up of five years or 10 years in some rare instances of patients who've stopped therapy. Does that mean the disease is never coming back? We'd like to be optimistic and think so, 
but um, for somebody who's 20 or 30 years old, that it's really difficult to be sure that uh, if they stop treatment uh, that their disease may never come back during the course of the next 50 years. And so it may be decades before, and it will be decades, truthfully, before we can convincingly state that, uh, that a CML patient is cured if we use that as a, as a, as a definition. Now, as Dr. Salio showed you, there uh, is encouraging evidence that the second generation TKIs, uh, in this case nilotinib, are achieving a higher rate of uh, deep molecular response uh, and faster than uh, patients who are treated with uh, imatinib. The other thing to note is that this rate is continuing to increase. Um, now, uh, if you look at the complete cytogenetic response rate, of course, that seems to plateau within the first couple of years with TKI therapy. And so I think it is certainly possible that we are gradually making deeper and deeper inroads into the disease burden, and that over time, there may be actually even an erosion of the CML stem cell population. It's difficult to know that with certainty, again, because these are very rare cells and very difficult to uh, quantify. But similar results have been seen, of course, with dasatinib. So again, there seems to be an increasing incidence over time uh, uh, with, in patients with a deep quality of remission, um, particularly with the second generation kinase inhibitors, but also uh, with uh, imatinib. I want to go over um, uh, a couple of what I think are rather provocative uh, anecdotal cases that touch upon some of the concepts that have been presented um, so far. So the first is a woman at my institution who initiated imatinib as her first therapy uh, and rapidly achieved a complete hematologic response um, and had a complete cytogenetic response documented just uh, less than one year uh, later. Um, she became pregnant uh, one year after that and um, was being followed by one of my colleagues, and uh, her imatinib was held. Now, she had not had a PCR test done before this because PCR was not widely uh, available uh, at the time. Uh, so she uh, delivered a healthy child, thankfully, and despite this lengthy interruption of imatinib in early 2004, her a CBC remained normal, and a PCR uh, test was done at that time, which revealed uh, an undetectable uh, uh, bcr able uh, transcript. Um, so my colleague did something that I think was rather bold at that time, and he suggested to this patient that she continue to hold her TKI therapy. Again, this is before any of the uh, STEM studies. And um, so in late 2009, she delivered a second healthy child and remained off TKI therapy. And in June of 2013 was the last of her molecular analyses to date. She's now being followed by uh, a different one of my colleagues who's actually only uh, performing yearly analysis on this patient, but she remains undetectable. So this is 10 years after TKI discontinuation, which to my mind is the longest uh, case that I've, that, that, that I've heard of. Now, a second case is actually rather interesting, but in, in a different way. Um, so this, this uh, individual was diagnosed back in 1998. Um, uh, unfortunately, when he was diagnosed, he was diagnosed simultaneously with kidney cancer and had a kidney removed. Um, he initiated interferon soon thereafter, uh, but coming back to Cheryl Ann's question, this is an individual who inter initiated interferon but did not have a, a deep response. Um, he discontinued therapy uh, after about six months and came down to UCLA, where I was at the time, and, and participated in the phase two study uh, with uh, imatinib. So we had a, a rather uh, quick achievement of a complete cytogenetic response, you see, by July of uh, 2010. Um, but over the subsequent years, he was always positive. He, his disease was always detectable by bcr able uh, PCR. Unfortunately, in 2006, Seven, he developed metastatic kidney cancer and had been prescribed um, bevacizumab as a preoperative medication, but had difficulty tolerating that in conjunction with his uh, imatinib. And my colleague who was taking care of him, rather than switching him to an alternative TKI, uh, actually told him to hold his uh, uh, imatinib because his disease was under such good control and his kidney cancer was what required immediate attention. And at that time, his b able transcript level, this is not on the international scale, but this would uh, represent a level between uh, an MMR and an MR4. So again, always positive and always uh, 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 quantifiable. And then what happened was he um, came back um, uh, in, so let me just go back one second. So this is October 2007 when he discontinued imatinib. And then in January of 2008, his value, again, after having uh, been off of imatinib, 
remained stable, so he remained off imatinib. Um, and then what happened subsequently, again, while continuing to hold imatinib, his level remained, uh, it not only remained constant, but it actually, actually declined. So off therapy, he actually had an improving molecular response. And then by uh, 2010, he tested negative and continues to test negative. Uh, his last value was recorded in August of 2013. Um, he died of his kidney cancer at the age of 81, uh, I'm sorry to report, uh, at, in, in late 2013. But um, he was, I think this case is really rather remarkable because this is a patient whose molecular response actually improved once he discontinued uh, imatinib therapy. So what does it mean? But we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but uh, hearkening back to something that Dr. Salio had mentioned, um, studies done um, in uh, Australia have shown that um, if you use a more sensitive test to detect BCR able, a research based test, you can frequently continue to detect evidence of BCR able even in those patients who stop TKI therapy and remain in a persistent uh, molecular uh, remission. And so this again harkens back to the idea that we don't think that we're eradicating um, these CML stem cells in the, in the majority of, of patients. Um, and also, as Dr. Sosella had just mentioned, um, there are uh, patients who have been shown to have expansion of uh, particular immune subsets uh, in, in actually on desatinib therapy, um, which um, begs the question as to whether or not these subsets are important in controlling the disease. And in this particular analysis, these are b serial positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients who are treated with desatinib. And if you break them down into those who achieve lymphocytosis versus those who do not, um, or those who develop lymphocytosis uh, versus those who do not, you see that the outcomes are far superior for those patients who actually do have uh, lymphocytosis. So coming back to our case, the reason I'm bringing this up is is that in, um, if you look at the bottom there, in late, in late 2008, um, um, this patient actually developed lymphocytosis. And um, of course, in an elderly individual, when I saw persistence of this, I thought it was important to make sure that this was not something like chronic lymphocytic leukemia arising in an elderly individual. And in fact, flow cytometry studies were performed, and this actually revealed a TNK uh, 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 population, which again arose off of imatinib therapy. And it, it raises the question, you know, could imatinib be potentially a double-edged sword? Could it be driving down the disease burden but simultaneously suppressing any type of immune-mediated uh, uh, means to control uh, the disease? So um, trying to explain, you know, this patient's uh, course is, of course, uh, I think this, although I presented this case to sort of be provocative, I mean, I think it does, in fact, uh, raise more questions than it, th than it answers. But, you know, one possibility that's formal, a formal possibility, which we, which we think is probably not likely, is that um, what we're detecting in this individual over time um, is or is not actually uh, the disease in stem cells, but is actually in long-lived T cells, um, which uh, we know can carry BCR able and may persist for years and years. Um, but again, we think that that's a, po that's a formal possibility, but um, uh, it, it's difficult to prove or disprove that. Um, the second one listed there is that the CML stem cells are actually held in check by the immune system, um, which again, I think there's um, a growing body of evidence to suggest that this may be the, the means by which um, the, uh, the disease can be held in check once patients stop therapy. But this raises another important question. If we think that the disease originally arose from an initial cell, what's different about the immune system now that it can take care of the disease, whereas when the disease originally arose? How did the disease originally arise in the same setting with the same immune system, uh, whereas now it's unable, and was unable to control it at that time, whereas now it's able to control it? So that, of course, remains in my mind, a very uh, uh, significant issue, but one that's rather difficult uh, to, uh, to understand. And then lastly is that this 4.5 log reduction is an arbitrary number. You know, it's, it's related to, in general, our limits of uh, detection. So it raises the possibility as to whether or not patients with lesser degrees of molecular response, such as MMR, um, could conceivably stop therapy and a significant proportion of them uh, achieve a prolonged uh, treatment free uh, remission. So coming to CML stem cells and whether uh, or not they can be eradicated, again, these studies are very difficult to um, translate um, 
to uh, patients for a number of reasons, and I'll get to that in a moment. But the first of these that I think was really rather eye-opening was back in 2008 when um, a group uh, uh, from um, uh, San Diego as well as a group um, in uh, North Carolina, two separate groups, found evidence that a particular pathway that can be important for self-renewal, um, this is the so-called uh, sonic hedgehog or uh, pathway, which can be uh, treated with an inhibitor of a protein called smoothened. Found this, these, both these groups found that this particular pathway seemed to be especially critical for the survival of um, what appeared to be CML stem cells, at least in the laboratory. And the good news was, of course, that there were small molecule inhibitors of this uh, pathway uh, ready to go into the clinic. Um, uh, unfortunately, to date, we've heard nothing about activity uh, of this particular pathway, and it's been a number of years. And I think that if anything promising had been observed in any of those studies, I suspect we might have heard uh, by now. So that's been you know, rather disheartening that two separate groups found evidence of a particular pathway that we could drug, and yet we didn't see anything uh, clinically. Now this slide um, shows you normal hematopoiesis on the top and then the diseased hematopoiesis on the bottom. But basically, it, it summarizes an incomplete uh, summer, uh, summary of different uh, uh, molecules which have been uh, uh, suggested may be uh, used to try to eradicate CML stem cells in patients. And you see a large number of uh, molecules, which on the one hand is, is very encouraging, uh, but on the other hand, it, it, it makes us question, you know, how can all these different pathways actually be, um, be important? It seems almost too good to be true. But um, here are some of the stem cell eradication strategies. Of course, you heard about the TKIs plus interferon. And I want to say, first of all, that I don't lump that strategy in with all these others because we know that interferon has activity on its own. We know that there are patients who took interferon a number of years ago as their only therapy and have remained off treatment for years with no evidence of disease. So that is, without question, uh, a different approach than some of these uh, other approaches that I have listed here. And again, I won't go through these uh, it, uh, in any them all, but every few months, if you pick up a scientific journal, there's some new article about how a new pathway is particularly critical for the survival of CML stem cells, at least in the laboratory or in mice. But how do we translate that to, to, to people? And um, so some of the challenges that I see is that, um, again, because these CML stem cells may be very similar to normal stem cells, I'm a bit skeptical that all these pathways could really be critical for the survival of, of CML stem cells in CML patients. And so how do we prioritize amongst these different studies? I, I mentioned to you the, 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 the smoothen studies, and again, I would imagine five years down the road, if there was any hint of activity, we probably would have heard of that, about that at, at a meeting by now. Um, and then the other thing is, of course, the clinical proof of concept is going to require years of follow-up. I mean, of course, the initial molecular response may be an early indicator, but what we all really want to know is, will this lead to the ability to interrupt their Therapy, stop therapy, and not have the disease come back for decades. And this remains obviously an important issue, but I'm just injecting a little dose of realism in terms of how soon it may be before we know if any of these approaches is really, is really effective. Um, so, and then the last thing I'll mention is that uh, in light of how and what the prognosis is, um, you know, we participated ourselves in a study of one of these uh, pathway inhibitors, and um, to eradicate CML stem cells, and we saw clear evidence of side effects, including hair loss and some other things that were not that were not all that pleasant. Um, and to what extent are people going to be motivated to participate in such a study when there's absolutely no indication that it will be beneficial if all the if all the suggestion comes from laboratory studies or animal studies? So these drugs, the, the, these uh, these approaches are going to have to be completely in my opinion, almost completely free from side effects in order to really uh, allow us to uh, accrue a substantial number of patients to, to answer this question. So um, basically, the last slide I have here is that molecular responses in TKI-treated patients do appear to deepen over time from what we've seen. 
um, which suggests a gradual elimination of long-lived CML cells. Whether these are stem cells uh, remains to be determined, um, but certainly the fact that some patients are able to discontinue therapy for years, I think, is, is obviously very uh, encouraging. Um, and as I just mentioned, uh, while there are a number of different pathways that have been identified as being particularly important for survival of CML stem cells, it's going to be very challenging to move this towards the clinic. And um, immunotherapeutic approaches, I mean, I think interferon in some ways is, of course, an immunotherapeutic approach that has substantial promise, but some of these other ones that we've heard about, including chimeric antigen receptor T cells that you may have heard about that can be useful in the lymphoid leukemias may be more challenging in this setting because there's going to be bystander toxicity on uh, normal cells. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions in the audience? Yeah? In your uh, two case study, uh, your, the patient uh, concerned achieved uh, uh, negative results uh, over a prolonged period uh, without taking any TKI. So does it mean that um, are these uh, part of the evidence that support that stem cell eradication can be achieved by TKI alone, or um, in the CML stem cell uh, eradication strategies, uh, which are going on like uh, TKI plus interferon or um, this SMO uh, approach, uh, are we uh, having a comparative study uh, carrying on um, currently. Um, so the, the, the two anecdotes I, that I propose, uh, that, that, that I mentioned, I want to say we have not done any, any deeper analysis to see whether they're positive by genomic DNA PCR or by the digital PCR that you heard of from Dr. Salio. Um, I, I would suspect that the odds are that they, that they were, that they did remain positive um, based upon the overall body uh, of, of literature. Um, as far as your question about, I think your question was in terms of some of the other studies, I mean, I know for one of the Smoothen studies, the plan was if patients responded, they would then uh, be uh, uh, either continued on therapy or taken off therapy to try to see if, if they could, if these deeper remissions actually translated to longer treatment-free remissions. Um, but um, again, we have not heard anything uh, about, uh, about these studies. I mean, maybe it'll be coming at this year's ASH, but I, I keep thinking that every year, and, 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 and then we never, we never hear about it. So, so my question is, uh, the, as you said, the treatment-free remission, uh, the longer period this is, the longer period of this uh, treatment-free remission, does it uh, demonstrate or, or some evidence of eradication of CML stem cell? Yeah, that's, so that's a great, I mean, I think the, the, the longer that we have these treatment-free remissions, like the 10 years I showed you, I mean, the, the more encouraging it is to us that at least a subset of patients, you know, may be able to discontinue therapy for a long time. Again, we're very conservative about using the, the word cure or about um, being confident that the stem cells are indeed eradicated. Um, um, but um, yeah, I think, uh, I think the next step will be to look at some of these long-lasting remissions using more sensitive uh, DNA PCR tests. Um, again, just because you detect the this, this, this signal by DNA PCR, it, it, it doesn't mean that those are necessarily stem cells, as, as, I, as I mentioned. Um, um, you know, so, so that issue, when we have a population of cells that's so infrequent, you know, ultimately the, the, the proof that they're, that, they're, that they're gone would be that you don't detect anything at all and over time, the disease never comes back. But again, that's that, that, that's a lot to that, that's a lot to, to sort of uh, answer at the present time. So is is it the the, the ultimate answer may have to uh, uh, leading to the technique of detection of CML stem cells? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the technique the development of technique for detection of uh, CML stem cell? Yeah, cases. I mean, I think, the, so, so these cells, as I mentioned, are infrequent, and we don't have, at the moment, great tools to detect, uh, to detect their presence. Thank you. Yeah. Cheryl? Uh, Dr. Shah, Greg Stevens and I were at a conference, the 50th anniversary of the uh, discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome, and one of the scientists stood up, and Greg and I have, this has been an ongoing argument on our memory skills, but he said that if you took a patient, if you took a room full of 100 people, 
70% of the people, and this is the argument, we don't know if it was 70 or 7 or 17, he was from Europe, uh, will test positive at one point in time for BCR able, but they will not develop CML. So do you uh, have any information for that on us? Yeah, so uh, back in the 90s when people had first developed the PCR test, you know, they were able to show that if you look at healthy individuals, a large, well not, a substantial proportion of them will test positive for having a BCR able fusion, uh, but they never go on to develop uh, CML. And that actually, that incidence actually increases with age. So the older we get, um, even if we're never diagnosed with CML, the more likely we are to be one of these people who tests positive. And of course, you have to ask the question in some of these people who are remaining PCR positive, is what we're detecting something that's, you know, a BCR able signal in a non-CML clone in a CML patient. I think that's, the, that's maybe what, what, your, what your question is, is leading to. Um, some of, the, some of the, the studies that were done in Australia where they looked use, using the genomic DNA, they used the patient's specific breakpoint from their CML clone. And so I, I think that, uh, that that's pretty good evidence that what they were actually detecting was related to their CML clone. Um, that, that's the best answer I have for you. But that's an important issue, and I think, I think Dr. Salio, if he's still here, he spoke to that a little bit about the limits of, uh, of uh, discrimination when it comes to the, 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 the digital PCR test, because he thinks as it gets more and more sensitive, the issue is you're going to start detecting, you know, signal at a level that you would expect to find in, in, in the healthy population. And so it, it, it kind of, it, 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 it leads to its own, its own separate problem from that. Right. Yes, hi. You're, you're next. You're next. No? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for that, uh, Dr. Shaw. I do have a question, though. Um, it's very exciting to hear um, about, uh, you know, treatment-free remission and how, um, you know, Dr. Uh, Salio is very positive um, in terms of there's no risk. And has, has there not been any patient who has um, relapsed and not regained their response? Like, has, what, what's the bad, there must be a bad side of the story. Yeah, so the, the, the early analysis suggests that the worst thing that happened when patients discontinued therapy, so you, you heard 60% had their disease burden rise. Um, the worst, the early uh, evidence suggested that if they restarted therapy, while 90% of them, while 100% of them started declining again, only 90% of them got back down to being undetectable. So they still had a very deep remission, but they were not, you know, in the 4.5 or, or, or lower level. Um, at the most recent ASH meeting, there was one patient who had discontinued, um, if, if I recall this correctly, who had discontinued for a period of time um, and then had gone back on therapy and I think had, um, had subsequently, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, yeah, I don't know if, if anybody here knows. Oh, can, can you, do you know the, the, the situation? I, I think it was Philip Roselou who could, uh, talked yeah. on this patient, and I think he regained a molecular response, but then after half a year, year or year, he was in accelerated phase, so uh, when I remember correctly. Yeah, so, so, so the, yeah, the, that's correct. So, so basically, there was a patient who um, who had had this and then regained response, and then I think either went into accelerated or blast phase, and then went into transplant and is still alive. But that that that, that that's one case, and I think I think Dr. Salio was was uh, was uh, briefly referencing that when he or do, yeah, he wants to say something. Go ahead. This is a case that just to be further investigated, I think, because it's not so clear even in the French report of this case. But it's one out of many, many cases, because apart the official cases which are in the literature, so far we do not have other in indication of this. Certainly, I would say a very late uh, progression of the disease is anecdotally possible. We know also of transplanted CML patients uh, that are, even after 10 years uh, from the, the, let's say, the transplant, uh, they had a, a sudden relapse uh, in a more advanced phase of the disease. So we cannot really exclude that uh, uh, this can happen. But certainly, statistically, it's a really an unusual uh, event, and a doctrinal event, as you want, that it, yeah. it cannot compare with other problems. Concerning the fact that there should be, um, let's say, uh, some negative 
aspect of this attempt. Of course, there are people who cannot really discontinue the therapy because the, 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 the therapy is uh, continuously maybe relapsing in some of these cases. But these are the cases who can enter investigational trial to try to, uh, so I think I'm not 100% sure that, but we have to start, of course, uh, to, 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 to deal with this problem of the therapy discontinuation and only by uh, not becoming, uh, I would say, not uh, being really passive, but just really active in promoting and trying to discontinue the therapy, this will, of course, uh, represent probably the future of the ML therapy per se. Yeah, and so if I can come back to, to your, um, so I mean, I think, um, so uh, the one last thing I recall about the blast phase transformation is that it did not, the patient did not have a B-serial kinase domain mutation. So it does suggest that that may have happened irrespective of, this, of, of, the, of the treatment break, but it doesn't prove it. Um, you know, so I, we have, we're all really very cautious about this approach initially because, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, one or two blast phase transformations in that French STEM study, and we would have said, okay, that's enough for us to say this should not be entertained because it's just not worth that sort of risk. Um, you know, it, with, with a growing body of evidence, I think we all have to sort of decide individually, you know, is this, we have to keep our eyes open and, and, and really, you know, think about the, the potential risk of this. But I, I would agree with Dr. Salio that on the whole, you know, the, the experience to date is, is really very, is, is for the most part quite reassuring. So, it's time for one last question for you. Uh, hello, Dr. I has got one page, oh, one question for you. I am a CML patient who has got 3515i mutation. So now I'm on ponatinib. So I would like to ask you, uh, like, because I have 3515i, so do you think that how long I can respond with the ponatinib? And for you as a doctor, would you recommend me to stay on the medicine or for go for stem cell transplant. Yeah, so first of all, I'm sorry that you have that, that mutation. Of course, that's the mutation that's been the most difficult to treat. I'm glad you, you're, I assume you're responding well to panatinib. Um, so uh, from an efficacy standpoint, we've all been very impressed with panatinib. Um, panatinib has the potential to, as you know, treat every last drug-resistant mutation. And the hope would be that it would then result in a very durable remission in most patients. Um, and in fact, I have some patients who've been on some of the phase one study. Um, I have six patients remaining on that trial. Um, and um, you know, some of these patients had no other options. And uh, um, so thankfully, their disease is remaining under very good control. As you know, the main concern with panatinib that has arisen in the most recent past is that um, there, are, uh, uh, there are thrombotic risks associated with it. Um, now, in somebody in your age, uh, if, assuming you don't have any other risk factors, I'd say that the, the, the likelihood of that um, is, is low, uh, but we, our follow-up is, is rather limited. Um, and so um, whether or not, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a very difficult question. I mean, if I had to sort of pick between saying you should stay on panatinib for the next 50 years versus have a transplant, um, I might say, if those are the two options, I might say in light of some of these thrombotic risks that are associated with panatinib, it makes me a little bit worried to think that, you know, that, that somebody your age could potentially over the next 10 or 15 years maybe have one of these events and that that might be potentially catastrophic. And that may steer me towards suggesting a stem cell transplant. On the other hand, there are other... Uh, uh, the good news is I, I'm, I'm sure that pharmaceutical companies see this as an opportunity, that they're, they're you know, panatinib didn't, has not, uh, the, the issues with panatinib has sort of reopened an opportunity to develop drugs that are hopefully safe, safer for, um, for uh, dealing with this particular mutation. So if I were taking care of you, I would probably 
try to get you on the lowest dose of panatinib to maintain your response. So I don't know what dose you're on, but try to get you down to 30 or 15 milligrams. I'm on 15 milligrams. Okay. Well, we can't, we can't go any lower than that. Um, so I would say continue that, and if you continue to respond, keep an eye out for um, other studies that may, be, um, that may be opening with activity against the T315I mutation. I wouldn't jump to those studies, and you wouldn't be eligible until you have some substantial disease that can be monitored because, you know, if you're in a very deep molecular response, you're not going to be eligible for such a study most likely. But um, I think those will be coming and in the next few years. Hopefully, we'll have some alternative options for people with that mutation.